So what did the master drainage plan do for us? Well, it really helped us to understand the hydrology of the watershed. And um, what we found out, what, this, this is one of, the, I find one of the most interesting pieces of information. I mean, there's tons of really interesting information. But within six hours of a rainfall, almost all the water that falls into, within that watershed is in the creek. Isn't that unbelievable? Six hours. And that's why we have these incredibly flashy, flashy flows that happen in that creek. If you're standing beside the creek, it starts to rain, maybe an hour later, all of a sudden, the, the creek will just go whoop. And then if it stops raining another 20 minutes, then it just goes right back down. It's really amazing how flashy it is. So what this study did is it looked at, you know, where is all this water coming in? We didn't do, we only did the master, we only did the modeling for um, the major inputs into the stream. We didn't do all of the, the lateral municipal pipes. Um, again, it was really expensive and the municipalities decided that they maybe didn't need that information or they were going to do it through another process where they did all of their pipe system and not just a portion of the watershed. Um, so it also looked at the areas of erosion. We did do some modeling to, to predict flows <coughs> and the areas of risk of flood. And then this was calibrated with known flood data. And the big thing that we did in the modeling was we, our future scenarios looked at climate change. So we had uh, the consultants do a bit of research and, and said, you know, what, what do we expect is going to happen in the future? So if we're giving projected future conditions as one of the scenarios in this model, we have to incorporate climate change into that projected future condition. So the parameters that we used at, the, at that time, the best available information that we had was for the Pacific Northwest, we were going to see a 15% increase in the duration and frequency of our winter rainfall. So, so that was developed into our future scenario. Those numbers were brought into our future scenario. And all of the um, engineering solutions and recommendations to have no flooding in a 25 year storm event in that future scenario have that incorporated right in. So here's some of the modeling data. And uh, you can see Hillside Mall, that, that large impervious area. So here's what happens currently, and you want to keep an eye on the colors. So the, the yellow color, that's a 10-year flood event. The green color, which you can hardly see any of here, is a 25-year flood event. And the peachy color is a 100-year flood extent. And the red is a 200-year flood extent. So this is what happens already when we have uh, major 100-year storms, we see a fair bit of flooding. And even in our 10-year storms at the lower as we're getting further down in the watershed, we see a pretty significant amount of flooding. So if we were to not do anything and climate change occurs, this is what is expected to happen. So we see a much, much more significant flooding at a 25 year event and uh, definitely some flooding again at the 100 year event. So all the areas that used to be red, which is a 200 year event, they're now going to flood in a, in a 100 year event. And some of the areas that only flooded in a 100 year event are now going to start flooding at a 25 year event. And then if we do the proposed upgrades, and, and in the master drainage plan we had a number of options. We, we kind of had six scenarios for, for proposed future upgrades. Um, one of the options was if we open the entire creek up, here's what we would need to do. If it was to be, you know, specifically engineering and pipes, here's what we would have to do. And as we were moving forward uh, trying to finalize that plan, we found it was very challenging to, to come to one specific recommendation. We, we couldn't go to the municipalities and say, open the whole thing up and we couldn't go to the municipalities and say put it all in a pipe and you need to ex increase the size of your pipes or double your pipes or, or whatever the, the solution was. And so again, we felt at that stage, we said we're just, we're still not ready because this doesn't bring in all the environmental and the social considerations. So we need to do more work because that's going to actually change 
what recommendation is put forward based on the specific area and what all those other uh, habitats and, and social values are in that area, that's actually going to change what the recommendation may be. So we held it. We talked to the municipalities about it and it went through the staff level. Some municipalities, we took it up to the council to discuss it with them and other municipalities, um, it, it never went to the councils. So the other thing that we talked about a lot was land use and you know how do we plan our communities how do we use our land? Uh, we looked a lot at uh, you know, various municipal policies and, and what kinds of policies did we need municipalities to move towards in order to achieve the vision and the blueprint that we put forward. And low impact development plays a, a very significant role in, in this area. We've always been talking about if we have 15% increase in, in flooding or in rainfall, frequency and duration of rainfall, does that mean we're gonna dig up every single storm pipe in the city and, and make it 15% larger? Or are we going to look at the options of how do we hold at least another 15% of the rainwater on the land so that we don't have to increase the capacity of every single pipe in, in, the, in the watershed? So that's a real focus of, of this blueprint is to look at low impact development and how do we address that urban runoff using either rainwater infiltration or retention. And this of course can happen at, at a site level, a neighborhood level, or at a